Hello, everybody. Welcome to Totally Tabled. My name is Shaggy, and today I'm running down my top 10 games of 2023. I'm a little late coming out with this video because I've been trying to get as many games as possible played, including a couple big ones that came in late in the year. Despite that, there's still a ton of games from 2023 that I just haven't gotten to yet. Plenty of games that could potentially make the list. So chances are things are going to change in the future. But this is my top 10 as of right now, based on what I've managed to get to the table. Now I want to hurry up and get started, but first I need to mention Castles of Burgundy Special Edition. This was my number one game to come out in 2023. Absolutely no surprise, it's a beautiful version of one of my favorite games. And it came out with a brand new solo mode. An incredible solo mode that makes Castles of Burgundy one of my favorite solo games of all time. So why am I talking about it now? Well, I felt like it was cheating just a little bit to put it on the list. So I'm going to talk about it here. Absolutely amazing. And the rest of the list will be brand new games that came out in 2023. Okay, enough preamble. Let's get started. Number 10 is Expeditions. I'm a little surprised this ultimately made the list because I have a lot of problems with Expeditions. You can watch my first impressions video to get all the details, but to summarize, I feel like this game was just overproduced. In too big of a box, components are too big, the minis, too expensive, and in fact, setting it in the Scythe universe and calling this the sequel to Scythe, I think just set up some false expectations. But if you're able to just put all that stuff to the side and you just focus on the gameplay, I actually think this is a really fun, quick and streamlined solo experience. I've only played it solo. I haven't played it at the other player counts. And frankly, I don't want to. I just like this as a solo game. There's only really three basic actions in the game. And most of the time, you're going to be picking two of the three actions to do. Occasionally, you'll get to do all three. But you're going to be moving. You have this hex map that you're moving around, exploring, uncovering tiles. You're then going to be able to gather, which means just taking the action that's on the tile that, that you end on. And the third action is just to play and resolve a card from your hand. But your turns are just really snappy. And thankfully, the solo AI system that they set up is equally as snappy. Just turning over a card, there's these two mechs that you're moving around. Most of the time, they're just blocking spaces. Occasionally, they'll do a quick little action. But it's so quick, and then you're right back to your turn. And you have some really fun card play here, using different colored workers, almost as like resources, in order to activate special abilities on those cards. There's a lot of potential here. I think a good expansion could really take this up to the next level. As it is, I think there's a fun game buried in here. And that's why it's my number 10, Expeditions. Number 9 is Siberion. Siberion is the latest game in the Oniverse series of games, a very popular solo or two-player series. I'm a big fan of these Oniverse games, and I have to say... I think Siberion is one of the best, if not the best one. And it's hard, it's a relatively simple card game. We have five colors of robots and they are of size one to five. And you have these machine cards that you are trying to fix with your robots and they need very specific types of robots in order to fix them. So a machine might need two purple robots or it might need two robots of size three, something like that. You start with five cards on the table in an area known as the platform, and you're just playing those cards to fix the machines. And when you fix a machine, you get to keep it into an experience pile, and you can use those in order to get special abilities for each robot. You're leveling up the different colors of robots, and they do different things, and it gets better and better. And so then another way that you could use those robots in your hand rather than repairing the machine is to activate the special ability which will let you, you know, draw more cards on your turn or shift robots into a different row where you can sort of hold on to them. It's a very clever system, very simple, but really fun to manipulate. From game to game, you can decide to upgrade different types of robots and use different special abilities and, and see how you can use that to manipulate things. And like with all of the Oniverse games, there are a bunch of little modules that you can add in really any combination. And they're going to up the difficulty a little bit by giving you a few more things that you have to consider, some more goals that you have to accomplish in order to win, but also give you little extra abilities that you can use to help. So it changes up the game a bit, adds to that replayability. 
Overall, this is just a wonderful, quick-playing solo game in a small package. Definitely check it out. My number nine, Siberion. Number eight is Legacy of You. This is a solo-only campaign-based Euro game. That's a pretty unusual combination. It also features some light legacy elements. Nothing gets destroyed, everything is fully resettable, but cards will be coming in and out and things will be changing over the course of many games throughout the campaign. There's even a storybook where you'll occasionally read passages and sometimes have to make decisions. And it's hard you're playing sort of a card management game. It's kind of loosely based on deck building without really being a deck builder. You have a starting deck of villager cards and each round you're gonna get four of those. And these cards are multi-use, so you can either discard the card to get the resource shown on top, or you can trash the card out from your deck in order to get the top two resources that are shown. And then you can also tuck the card, which is also removing it from your deck, in order to get ongoing income at the beginning of each round. And what you're ultimately trying to do is to use these resources in order to build out this canal, because there's a flood token that is moving across the board, and it moves every time you have to shuffle your deck back up. And so you really wanna maximize that deck, all right? The deck is more of like a resource. You wanna have as many cards in there as possible so that that flood will move as slowly as possible. Because if it ever catches up to a portion of the canal that you haven't yet built, then you lose. You're also using resources to build buildings and to fight off these barbarians that are showing up. So it's all about the card management and the resource management knowing when to trash cards in order to get those extra resources that you need to be efficient, but also making sure that that deck is kept nice and beefy so you can stay ahead of the flood. And occasionally things will happen where you're gonna read a little story element and new cards will come in or cards will change or get removed from the game. And each game, depending on whether you win or lose, you're gonna have different mechanisms introduced or get different special abilities. I struggle with campaign games and, you know, I haven't yet finished this one. I really want to, but it's a really fun, puzzly, crunchy Euro experience, despite having relatively simple rules. And so that's my number eight, Legacy of You. Number seven is Distilled. We have a bit of a theme here so far on the list because this is another relatively simple game at heart. Despite this lavish, gorgeous production, this is a pretty straightforward card game where you're using money to purchase ingredients that you're then going to combine to create various spirits. You're going to be crafting everything from moonshine to vodka to whiskeys and rums. And then depending on what you make, you can age them in barrels and eventually bottle and sell them for money. And that money you'll use to get more ingredients, better ingredients, as well as upgrades and fancy bottles and <laughs> helpers with special abilities and stuff like that. Now the push your luck aspect comes from the fact that you're going to be taking whatever you've created as your spirit, all the cards that you've added, you're going to shuffle those up and then you're gonna remove the top card and the bottom card. That means that it's possible that you might lose a key ingredient that you needed in order to make the recipe that you were trying to make. So to protect against that, you might want to add more of the ingredient than you actually need, just in case you lose it. And that's sort of where the press your luck comes from. It all really comes together into a quite thematic experience. And the solo takes it up to another notch because now you have these goals that you have to meet. And they're arranged off to the side, actually in sort of the shape of a barrel. And you have to sort of figure out a path through these goals and try to complete all of them and get to the top. It's one of my favorite types of solo systems because it gets completely out of the way. And it just gives you all these extra things that you have to consider. This is a wonderful design that I'm not hearing that much about, and I'm not sure why, but Distilled was definitely one of my favorite games of the year. That's why it's my number seven. Number six is Tamashi Chronicle of Ascend. This is a cooperative scenario-based game where you can play a campaign or you can play them as one-off scenarios. The game takes place during an AI apocalypse, and you play as a human survivor who's able to upload their consciousness into other bodies. It's a very bizarre and interesting story, but the real star of the show here for me is this 
great central mechanism that involves essentially a slide puzzle. You'd be drawing these different colored tokens out of a bag and putting it onto your grid and then manipulating them on the grid in order to form patterns that will get you various different types of resources as well as allow you to do special actions. Much of the game will involve exploring a map and fighting off various deadly mechanical monsters that you're going to meet along the way. Combat involves dice rolling with a, a lot of mitigation. And you're also going to get to have get upgrades and even unlock new bodies that have special abilities. And as you complete the different scenarios, new cards will get unlocked and new tiles and the game will kind of grow and change. I really like that you don't have to play this as a campaign. You can just play the one-off scenarios. The different scenarios have different lengths and different difficulty levels. So you can kind of pick and choose the one that's right for you, however you're feeling. And I just find the slide puzzle mechanism so much fun and just so enjoyable. That really keeps me coming back for more. And I really hope that it's a mechanism that we start seeing in other games as well. This one doesn't seem to be getting as much attention as I think it deserves. So check it out. That's my number six, Tamashi Chronicle of Ascent. Number five is Darwin's Journey. Darwin's Journey is a worker placement game about recalling Charles Darwin's time on the Galapagos Island while he was developing the theory of evolution. One of the hooks of this game is your workers can actually study and get more powerful through the use of these wax seals. Those seals come in different colors that relate to the different main actions that you can take. So you can give them more colors to make them more versatile or a lot of the same color to make them more powerful on that particular action. There's also some special actions that are different each game. You get a random assortment and you're going to be exploring these islands and discovering new species and then taking those species to the museum. You'll be sailing your ship down this track, which will let you access new islands. You'll be laying down tents there and you have objectives to complete. And you can really get these combo-rific turns where you go to a spot on an island that lets you do this other thing, which lets you do another thing. It's a lot of Yuri goodness and pretty darn heavy, especially when you incorporate the solo mode with a fairly complex solo AI. It took me a little while to get the hang of using it, but once I did, they really provided a real challenge, especially on some of the higher difficulty levels. It's still very much a Euro game, but the theme still draws me in. That's why it's my number five, Darwin's Journey. Number four is Oranienburger Canal. This is a clever, puzzly Rosenberg game for one to two players that is just not getting enough attention. I think it had a pretty small print run and, you know, the look and the theme is not exactly anything to write home about, but the puzzly gameplay is just right up my alley. You're using these seven different action spots, one of which is blocked off in each round. And you're going to activate four of those action spots in order to get resources in order to place cards out onto your tableau, onto this board. It's basically a four by three grid. And these cards have bonuses on them, but you can't activate them until you have surrounded the card on all sides by these different root tiles. And there's four different types of routes. There's like a, there's paths, roads, canals, and railroad track. And so once you've surrounded the card, you then activate it, and each card wants certain combinations of paths around it. And they'll give you more resources or points or whatever. That seems so simple and straightforward, but the puzzle of trying to get these paths just right and laying the cards just right and activating them at the right time so you have the right resources so you can be efficient. I don't know. I found it to be incredibly brain burnery and satisfying when you can piece these things together just right. And what's cool is the game comes with a bunch of different decks that you can use that have different buildings in them with different abilities that really do change up the strategy of the game and how you have to approach the puzzle. I really hope this one gets more attention as it gets a wider release. Don't let the look throw you off. You definitely want to check this one out. It's my number four, Iranian Burger Canal. Number three is Halls of Hegra. All the way back in August, I declared this my front runner for game of the year. You can go check out my playthrough and my first impressions video 
I go into a lot of detail about exactly why I love this solo-only war-themed game. So it's a little bit of a surprise to see it here at number three, but this deserves to be number one. It really is that good. Now, normally I don't go for war games or even war-themed games, but this one caught my eye because some of the mechanisms were inspired by Robinson Crusoe and This War of Mine, two of my favorite survival games. This game actually borrows a lot of mechanisms from various games, but it all comes together in a very unique feeling package. You have worker placement here with a bunch of different types of workers that are better at doing certain tasks than others. You have tower defense as you're trying to hold this abandoned mountain fortress from German forces uh, in the early days of World War II. You have some sort of pick up and deliver kind of stuff where you're creating these supply lines, going out and getting stuff and bringing it back, trying to avoid patrols. And this really clever bag building system where you're sort of pushing your luck, drawing out workers, as well as a hit bag where when you take damage, you pull out of that bag to see which of your spots gets broken and needing repair. And the game really excels at ramping up the tension as you go along. As your supplies dwindle and your morale is going down and you're just trying to hang on and survive. It's an absolutely brutally difficult game. But that's how I like my survival experiences. So I just can't recommend this one enough. That's my number three, Halls of Hegra. Number two is Earthborn Rangers. Once again, when I played this, I thought for sure this would be my number one of the year, and it so deserves to be. This is a cooperative adventure card game. It's fairly reminiscent to games like the Lord of the Rings card game or Arkham Horror the card game. You start by constructing a deck that represents your, your character, your ranger. And you're going to build that with cards based on, you know, the background that you select for your character and their profession. You're also going to select an aspect card, which basically represents their personality. Then you're going to use these cards to travel around to different locations with a real emphasis on exploration. You're going to meet people and talk to them. You're going to see exciting things. And along the way, you'll get these quests and slowly kind of uncover some of the mysteries of this world. But what really gets me excited is just having this open world that I can travel around and discover new things. It gives me a lot of the same feels that I get from a game that I love, Sleeping Gods. But here there's much less focus on combat. This is really sort of a laid back, slow paced, kind of chilled out experience. I also love how alive the world feels. You might go to a place and you discover like a deer and some plants and then you're talking with someone and in the background the deer might go over and just eat the plant or a predator might come in and attack the deer. Things can just happen in the background and the world can just change and it really has nothing to do with you. It's just a very cool clever system. Please check out my tutorial playthrough on this one as well as my first impressions to learn more. But that's my number two, Earthborn Rangers. And finally, my number one solo board game for 2023 is Voidfall. This is the final game that I played last year. It's the first game that I've played this year. I'm currently editing my playthrough of it and it's still on the table. This game has dominated the last three weeks of my life. It's why everything on the channel has been delayed, but it's all been worth it because this game is a masterpiece. Now I want to give a warning here if you're thinking of playing this game. The learning curve here is one of the most painful that I've ever experienced. Frostpunk, my game of the year from 2022, that's a heavy, complicated, long, epic game that's hard to learn, but that's nothing compared to Voidfall. And I want to be clear, that has nothing to do with the quality of the rulebook or anything. In fact, quite the opposite. Mind Clash has done everything they possibly could to make this game easy to learn. And Ian O'Toole has just pulled off another miracle. This is his magnum opus. It's just that this game has so many moving parts, so many little bits and pieces, so many icons that you need to internalize. It's like learning a whole new language. But it all needs to be there to make this game what it is. Everything has a purpose. I don't desire any of this to be streamlined. It's just a massive 
complex puzzle and there's just no getting around it. You just have to put in the work and the time and suffer. <laughs> but once you do, and once you reach the top of the mountain, this game just opens up and reveals itself. You're going to see a lot of people talking about how, oh, the game isn't as complicated as you think it is. And that's true once you learn it. The learning process is complicated. It takes over an hour to set up the game the first time. It takes multiple, multiple plays before you can start to get your hands around what's going on, especially if you're playing solo. But once you have it, this plays really fast for a heavy Euro. Way faster than Frostpunk. It feels like playing a Vital Asserta game. So how does Voidfall play? Well, in brief, a game takes place over three cycles. In each cycle, you're going to have four to six turns. On your turn, you're going to play a focus card from your hand, and each card has three different actions on it. Most of the time, you're going to resolve two of those actions in whatever order you want. These actions are going to let you do all sorts of things, like putting out more fleets on the map, increasing your population, adding guilds that will provide you with one of the five different resources, build military installations, invent new technologies that give you all sorts of special powers, invade adjacent sectors to push back the Voidborn, advance your civilization, all of these different things. But in the solo game, at the beginning of each turn, a crisis card is revealed. And ideally, you'd like to be able to deal with that crisis by the end of your turn. If you don't, then you have to put it on the crisis board and these crises start building up. And so a big part of the puzzle is trying to figure out how to take your actions and complete what you want to do on the board while also taking care of these crises and keeping them under control. All of these gears come together to make one of the most complex and satisfying puzzles I've ever played. You have so many possibilities on your turn, so many different ways that you can accomplish different things. The way I play this game is at the beginning of every cycle, I just sit there and plan out my entire round. Every turn, all 10 to 15 actions that I plan to take in the order that I plan to take them. I create this massive plan and I can sit there and just puzzle that out for forever. <laughs> and then eventually I start playing with that plan in mind and just react as each crisis card is revealed. Sometimes I can ignore it. Sometimes I need to change my plan in order to deal with it. For someone like myself that loves puzzly games, this is an absolute dream. It kind of shocks me that this has a competitive and a cooperative mode because I can't imagine playing it with other people. I don't want other people around while I'm sitting here coming up with my master plan for like half an hour. I'm sure those other modes work fantastically well, but I've only played this solo and gosh, I'm not sure I'd want to play it any other way. It just works so well. There's a ton of scenarios in the box. There's a host of different houses that you can play as with different special abilities, different decks, right? Some with unique actions. It's incredible. And then you mix in all the different events, the different crisis cards, the different technologies that can come up. There's so much variety. I can really see this game becoming another Spirit Island, a game that just takes over people's solo gaming lives and rockets to be their number one game of all time. I'm not quite there yet, but it's definitely my number one game of 2023. That's Voidfall. There we go, 10 amazing games. Which ones did I miss? Again, I haven't played everything from 2023. I missed a lot of them, and this list is probably bound to change as I play more. But please let me know what games I missed in the comments below. And if you want to find out more about these games, I've done full playthroughs of every single one, except for Voidfall, which is coming. At the time of release of this video, the Voidfall playthrough should be about a week away. And if you're watching this in the future, then it's probably there already. So please go check out all of those playthroughs. I'll have the links in the description below. You can also like this video and subscribe to the channel if you want to support what we do here at Totally Tabled. But that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye.